Section 24 of The Flight of the Heron by D. K. Broster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eileen. Part 5. The Heron's Flight is Ended. Quote, Hereafter, in a better world than this, I shall desire more love and knowledge of you. End quote. Shakespeare. Chapter 1. It was fortunate for Ewan that the sorrel horse on which he was tied had easy paces, and that the troopers did not ride fast. Fortunate, too, that his arms had been bound to his sides and not behind his back, as had first been proposed when, limping badly and shielding his eyes against the unaccustomed daylight, he was brought out into the courtyard of the fort to be mounted. For by midday, so many hours in the saddle, under a July sun, were making heavy demands on a man come straight from close confinement and not long recovered of a severe wound. But from Ewan's spirit a much heavier toll was being exacted, not by the prospect of the death which was in all likelihood awaiting him, not even by the remembrance of his lost Alison, but by the pain which was actually tearing at him now, this taking leave of what he loved better than life, the lakes and mountains of his home. This was the real death, and he kept his lips locked, lest he should cry out at its sharpness. The picture which had been tormenting Keith Wyndham he could look at without undue shrinking. Or rather, he did not trouble to look at it any more now. Like the man who had saved him, he could not avoid the thought that Guthrie's musket balls had been more merciful. But the choice had not lain in his hands, and for the last two months, it had been more important to try to keep his equanimity day after day in the cold and darkness of his prison than to think what he should do or feel when he came to stand in the hangman's cart. And the parting with Alison was over, and because he had known that the kiss in the cabin of the brig might be their last, it had held the solemnity which had enwrapped their hurried marriage and the bridal night whose memory was so holy to him. Alison had been his, though for so brief a space, and one day, as he firmly believed, they would meet again. But, by and tea, would he ever see again, in that world, his beloved sentinel of the stars? Ever since its peak had appeared, all flushed by the morning sun, as they began to ride by Loch Oich, he had kept his eyes hungrily upon it, praying that the horses might go slower, or that one might cast a shoe, watching it like a lover, as it revealed more of its shapeliness and dominated the shoulder, between it and the lock, behind which, as they went farther, it would inevitably sink. And Loch Nahollere, his loch, away behind there, invisible, secluded by its own mountains. If only he could get free of these cords, swim the water between, climb those intervening miles of scree and heather, and see the Eagle's Lake once more. No, never again, neither in this world nor the next. For Lochna Hollere was not like Alison and him. It had not a soul free of time and space. Lochna Hollere existed over there, only there, on that one spot of earth, and in all the fields of heaven there would be no lake so lovely, and in heaven the grey mists would never swoop down on one who ambushed the deer. At Lagan Achdram they had halted and rested and eaten. It was Glengarry's country, yet on the border of the Cameron and Ardry was known there. But in the burnt and ravaged Clachen there seemed to be no man left, and no risk of a rescue. The troopers of Kingston's horse had shown themselves rough but not unkindly, and the sergeant, probably thinking that unless they gave the prisoner some attention, they would hardly get him to Fort William at the end of the day, had him unfastened and taken off the sorrel, and sat down amongst them by the roadside with food and drink. But they were very careful of him, tying his ankles together, and putting a cord from one wrist to the belt of the next man. And Ewan had eaten and drunk in silence, looking at the sunlit desolation. This was what had been done in the glen, done in all the countryside. A young girl had passed once or twice to a half-burnt croft carrying a bucket of water, and presently the sergeant, wanting some for the horses, called to ask where the water came from, since here they were no longer by a lakeside. Setting down the heavy bucket, she came and stood before him, 
looking on the troopers with eyes like coals, and only once at their prisoner. But the softness of evening was in them then. The sergeant, without harshness, put his question, but the girl shook her head, and Ewan knew that she had not the English. Already he had seen a sight that set his heart beating, for as she stooped to put down the bucket, he had caught a glimpse of the black handle of a Sigi and in her bosom. "'Shall I ask her for you?' he suggested to the sergeant, and, hardly waiting for the answer, he spoke rapidly to her in Gaelic, putting the question about water, indeed, but adding at the end of it, "'Try to give me your knife when I am on the horse again, if you have another for yourself.' The girl gave him a glance of comprehension, and turned away to show where to fetch the water, and the sergeant had no inkling that another question, besides his, had been put and answered. He even threw a word of thanks to the interpreter. But while they were tying Ewan on again, the girl came among them, as if curiosity had brought her to see the sight, and, heedless of the jests which she did not understand, slipped nearer and nearer among the horses until she seemed to be jostled against the sorrel's shoulder. And Ewan felt the little knife, warm from its hiding-place, slide into his right stocking. It was only with an effort that he kept his eyes averted, and seemed unaware of her presence. But he turned his head as they rode away, and saw her standing at gaze with her hands joined, as though she were praying. That was an hour agone, and more. How he should ever get at, much less use, the blade against his leg he had no idea, seeing that his arms were immovably pinioned, but to know it there made a world of difference. His thoughts reverted to Major Wyndham, to that interview yesterday. They might have been friends, had fate willed it otherwise. Indeed, he could not but think of him already as a friend, and with wonder at what he had done for him. But why had Angus's heron brought them together to so little purpose, to meet and meet, and then depart for ever, as they had met at first, by the side of water, Loch Oich and Loch Ness. Yet he owed his life to one of those encounters, there was no possible doubt of that. But it was still a mystery to him why the Englishman should have cared so much for his fate as to wreck his own career over it. He had really behaved to Loudon, and, as far as he could make out, to Cumberland, all honour to him for it, as if he were fay and he had seemed at the outset of their acquaintance of so mocking a temper, so lightly contemptuous as scarcely even to be hostile. One saw him with different eyes now. But Keith Wyndham was swept from his thoughts again, as he realized afresh that he was going for the last time along Loch Lochy's side. It was bright pain to look at it, but Ewan looked greedily, trying to burn those high green slopes forever on his memory to be imaged there as long as that memory itself was undissolved. There was the steep quarry and the wall shutting out his home. What though the house of Ardroy were ashes now, like Agnacari and a score of others, there were things the marauders could not touch, things dearer even than the old house, the sweeps of fern and heather, the hundred little burns sliding and tinkling among stones and mosses, the dark pine trees, the birches stepping delicately down the torrent side, the mist and the wind, the very mountain air itself. But these, though they would remain, were not for him any more. And then Ewan bit his lip hard, for, to his horror, his eyes had begun to fill, and, since he could not move a hand, all that was left was to bow his head and pray desperately that the troopers on either side might not observe his weakness but they were just then absorbed in heartfelt complaints at the detour which they were obliged to make on his account, instead of setting out with the rest of Kingston's horse, in two days' time, for Edinburgh, and Ewan quickly swallowed the salt upon his lips, thinking, since I am so little of a man, I must fix my mind on something else. Yet here, in this dear and familiar neighbourhood, he could think of nothing else but what was before his eyes and his eyes told him now that the radiance of the morning was gone, and that clouds were coming up the glen from the southwest, from Loch Linne, with that rapidity which he knew so well of old. In an hour it would very likely be raining hard, unless, for beyond the Loch Arkig break, he could see that it was raining. Here he was, looking just as intently at the hills as before. 
so he shut his eyes, afraid lest moisture should spring into them again, and also a little because the waters of Loch Lochy, still bright, despite the advancing clouds, were beginning queerly to dazzle him. And when his eyes were shut, he realized with increasing clearness that physically, too, he was nearing the boundary line of endurance. He had wondered himself how he should ever accomplish the thirty-mile ride, but the problem had not troubled him much, and the untying and rest at Lagan had been a relief. Now, and they still had a long way to go, it was astonishing how the sea of faintness seemed to be gaining upon him. He reopened his eyes as he felt himself give a great lurch in the saddle. Hold up, said the trooper who had the reins. Were you asleep? Ewan shook his head. But what curious specks were floating over the darkening landscape? He fixed his eyes on his horse's ears, but once or twice the whole head of the animal disappeared from his sight altogether. And the second time that this phenomenon occurred, he felt a grip on his arm and found the soldier on the other side looking at him curiously. However, the man released him, saying nothing, and Ewan, mute also, tried to straighten himself in the saddle, and looked ahead in the direction of Ben Nevis, since perhaps it was a mistake to look at anything close at hand. The mountain's top was veiled. The last time that he had seen it, with Lochiel. But that memory had poison in it now. Oh, to have speech with Lochiel once, before he went hence. Ewan set his teeth, as waves of faintness and of mental pain broke on him together. If he could only say to Donald. And there followed on that, surprisingly, a period in which he thought he was speaking to Lochiel. But it must have been by some waterfall, the waterfall near the hiding place, perhaps, and through the noise of the rushing water he could not make Lochiel hear what he was saying to him. He tried and tried. Then, all at once, someone was holding him round the body, and a voice called out, miles away, yet close. He was near off that time, Sergeant. Ewan left the waterfall and became conscious, to his astonishment, that they were away from Lochy and within full sight of Ben Nevis and all his brethren, also that the whole escort had stopped. Landscape and horses then whirled violently round, his head fell on a trooper's shoulder. Are the prisoners swounding, sergeant? What are we to do? Swearing under his breath, the sergeant brought his horse alongside. Shamming? No, he ain't shamming. Here. He brought out something from his holster. Give him a drink of his own highland whiskey. Nasty stuff it is. They held up Ewan's head and put the spirit to his lips. It revived him a little, and he tried to say something, but he himself did not know what it was. The sergeant eyed him doubtfully. "'I'll tell you what,' he remarked to his men. "'We'll untie his arms, not his feet, mind you, and maybe then he can help himself by taking a hold of the mane. Can you do that?' Ewan nodded, too sick and dizzy to realize what possibilities would thus be put within his reach. The dragoons unfastened the cords round his arms and body, gave him some more spirit, rubbed his cramped arms, and in a little while he was able to do what the sergeant suggested, and presently, he leaning hard upon the sorrel's crest, his fingers twined in the mane, they were going slowly down the moorland slope towards the spin. Ewan felt less faint now, after the whisky and the release of his arms. The fine misty rain which had now set in was refreshing, too, so— Although the landscape showed a disposition to swim at times, he could certainly keep in the saddle. Indeed, how could he fall off, he thought, with this rope passing from ankle to ankle beneath the horse's belly. And he began to think about Highbridge, still unseen, which they were approaching, and of the part which it had played in this great and ill-fated adventure, and in his own private fortunes, too. For down there the first spark of revolt had flashed out, down there, Keith Wyndham had been turned back by MacDonald of Tiendrish and his men, and because he had been turned back, Ewan himself was alive today, and not mouldering by Neil McMartin's side on Bine Lee. But he was, none the less, on his way to death, and there was no one to stay the redcoats from passing Highbridge now. Tiendrish, marked for the scaffold, lay already in Edinburgh Castle. Capoch, his chief, 
slept with his broken heart among the heather on Culloden Moor. Lochiel was a wounded outlaw with a price on his head. The gods had taken rigorous dues from all who had been concerned in the doings of that August day here by the Spean. Yes, strangely enough, even from Keith Wyndham, who was on the other side. They had made him pay for having dared to show compassion to those whom they pursued. It was singular. Unconsciously, Ewan was back in the dungeon again, seeing the Englishman's troubled face, hearing his voice as it asked him why he had put him in mind of the forgotten penknife. And then Keith Wyndham's face and voice were blotted out in an instant by a thought which made him draw a long breath and clutch the sorrel's mane almost convulsively. He had something better than a blunt penknife on his person at this very moment, and now, now that his arms were untied, he could perhaps get it into his hand. For the last hour he had completely forgotten the girl's Sigian and his stocking, and indeed, until recently it might as well not have been there. But now, if he could draw it out unobserved. And then? Rags of a wild, a desperate plan began to flutter before his eyes. And only here, by the spian, could the plan be put into execution, because, Highbridge once crossed, it was all open moorland to Fort William. Only by the spian, racing along between its steep, thickly wooded banks, was there a chance of shelter, if one could gain it. It was a mad scheme, and would very likely result in his being shot dead, but, if they stopped at the little change-house on the other side of Spian, as they surely would, he would risk that. Better to die by a bullet than by the rope and the knife. How his body would carry out the orders of his brain he did not know. Very ill, probably, to judge from his late experiences. Yet, as he hastily plotted out what he would do, and every moment was carried nearer to Highbridge, Ewan had an illusory feeling of vigour, but he knew that he must not show it. On the contrary, his present partially unbound condition, being due to his recent only too real faintness, he must continue to simulate what for the moment he no longer felt. If only the faintness did not come on again in earnest. Here was the spian in its ravine, and here the narrow bridge reared on its two arches, its central pier rising from a large rock in the river bed. They clattered over it, three abreast. The bridge was invisible, as Ewan knew, when one was fairly up the other side, because the approach was at so sharp an angle, and the trees so thick. And as they went up that steep approach, the trees seemed even thicker than he remembered them. If Spian did not save him, nothing could. The change-house came into view above them, a little low building by the side of the road, and for a moment the prisoner knew an agonizing doubt whether the escort were going to halt there, after all. Oh, yes, thank God, they were. Indeed, it would have been remarkable had they passed it. The moment the troopers stopped, it was evident how little they considered that their prisoner needed guarding now. It was very different from the care which they had bestowed in this particular at Lagan. Drink was brought out, nearly all swung off their horses, and broke into jests and laughter among themselves. Ewan's all but collapse a few miles back, his real and evident exhaustion now, served him as nothing else could have done. Realizing this, he let himself slide slowly farther over his horse's neck, as though he could scarcely sit in the saddle at all, and in fact this manoeuvre called for but little dissimulation. And at that point the trooper who had charge of his reins, a young man, not so boisterous as the others, was apparently smitten with compassion. His own half-finished chopping in his hand, he looked up at the drooping figure. "'You'd be the better of another drink, eh? Shall I fetch you one?' Not quite sure whether this solicitude was to his advantage, Ewan intimated that he would be glad of a cup of water. The dragoon finished his draught, tossed the reins to one of his fellows, and sauntered off. But the other man was too careless, or too much occupied to catch the reins, and they swung forward below the sorrel's head, free. This was a piece of quite unforeseen good luck. Ewan's head sank right on to his horse's crest. Already his right hand, apparently dangling helpless, had slipped the little black knife out of his stocking. Now he was able unsuspected to reach the rope round his right ankle. Five seconds, and it was cut through. 
and the next instant his horse was snorting and rearing from a violent prick with the steel. The dismounted men near scattered involuntarily. Ewan reached forward, caught a rein, turned the horse, and, before the startled troopers in the least realized what was happening, was racing down the slope and had disappeared in the thick fringe of trees about the bridge. The sorrel was so maddened that to slip off before he reached the bridge, as he intended, was going to be a matter of difficulty, if not of danger. But it had to be done. He threw himself across the saddle and did it. As he reached ground he staggered and fell, wrenching his damaged thigh, but the horse continued its wild career across the bridge and up the farther slope, as he had designed. Ewan had but a second or two in which to pick himself up and lurch into the thick undergrowth of the gorge ere the first of a stream of cursing horsemen came tearing down the slope. But, as he hoped, having heard hoofbeats on the bridge, they all went straight over it in pursuit of the now vanished horse, never dreaming that it was riderless. Once they were over, Ewan cut away the trailing rope from his other ankle, pocketed it, and started to plunge on as fast as he could among the birch and rowan trees, the moss-covered stones, and the undergrowth of Spian's side. He was fairly sure that he was invisible from above, and though not, perhaps, from the other side, if and when the troopers returned. But the farther from the bridge, the better. His breath came in gasps. The jar of throwing himself off the horse had caused him great pain, and made him lamer than ever, and at last he was forced to go forward on his hands and knees, dragging his injured leg after him. But as he went he thought how hopeless it was, how the dragoons would soon overtake the horse, or see from a distance that he was no longer on its back, and, returning, would search along the river bank and find him. And he could not possibly go much farther, weak and out of condition as he was, with a sweat pouring off him, and Spian below seeming to make a noise much louder than its diminished summer clamour. Thus crawling, he finally came up against a huge green boulder, and the obstacle daunted him. He would stop here, just round the farther side. He dragged himself round somehow, and saw that what he had thought to be one stone was two, leaning together. He tried to creep into the dark hollow between them, a place like the tomb, but it was too narrow for his breadth of shoulder. So he sank down by it, and lay there with his cheek to the damp mould, and wondered whether he were dying. Louder and louder roared the spian below, and he somehow was tossing in its stream. Then at least he could die in Scotland after all. Best not to struggle. Best to think that he was in Alison's arms. She would know how spent he was, and how cold. The brawling of the river died away into darkness. End of section 24